Manchester United to be banned from Europe if Jim Ratcliffe is successful with his ownership bid because of Nice's current success in League One. Is this a big setback for Ratcliffe? Is this a big setback for United? Or is there a loophole around this? We will discuss that. We will discuss the transfer ins and the transfer out news. A lot of it to do with midfielders. Fabrizio Romano's the move for one of the midfielders is very, very likely. And then we'll talk about sort of Man United's poor start to the season. Tenog did a little interview talking about our poor start to the season. We'll delve into some of the problems. And then we'll talk about players that are expected to be available and play versus Everton and who isn't. So please do hit that like button. Of course, subscribe down below if you're new. Let's get right into this Europe being banned story because we've got lots to get through. It was said by the sun and you'll be thinking, look, the sun, the pinch of salt, sun, the sun's rubbish. But the sun, um, what they're saying is something that I think a lot of people will be thinking. I think the sun are making a solid point here because we know about the multi-ownership thing in UEFA League. So although it's come out from the sun, this is actually a story from the sun where you're like, actually, well, this is a situation that Man United need to address. It was said by The Sun, of course, here. Uh, the surgeon Ratcliffe's ownership of Nice could see Manchester United banned from Europe next season. Under the UEFA's multi-club ownership rules, the only way Man United and Nice can both play in Europe in their next campaign is if one seals automatic Champions League spot and the other qualifies directly for the Conference League. If both finish in the Champions League spots in their respective decisions, the team that finishes higher of the two gets the place and the other one is banned from Europe. So what that essentially means is Nice could come first in the French League, we come second in the Premier League. Nice, because they finished higher in their league, will then get Champions League and then we'll be put in the Conference League. We won't be put in the, the Champions League, we won't be put in the Europa League because if you fail in your Champions League group, you get put in the Europa League or we will be put in the Conference League if we came second and Nice came first. If Man United and Nice both came first in their league, then Man United would qualify for the Champions League because the Premier League is rated as a higher league than League 1. But that is my point. And Nice are having a very good season. They look like they're going to finish in the top two or top three. We don't look like we're going to finish in the top three in the Premier League. But also, even if we finish fifth this season, that could be enough to qualify for the Champions League. But if Nice are there, boom, United aren't in Champions League or even the Europa League. Uh, we are in the Conference League, which is a big blow and a big blow money-wise, which is why I think there's got to be a loophole because surely the Glazers wouldn't upset Jim knowing they could maybe miss out on 50 million this year. It was so the UEFA source confirmed, as the rules stand, it's a clear situation. Ineos own Nice and are set to have a significant role in running Man United. Unless the regulations are changed or Ineos sell one of their stakes, they can, can they cannot both play in European competitions unless one is in the Champions League and the other is in the Europa League. So Basically, it's all about sort of the UEFA rules. And the UEFA rules are quite strict about shared ownership. A lot of people mention RB Leipzig and RB Salzburg, but they like changed quite a lot of things to get around it. And I think they used, I think, fan ownership as, as part of it as well when they got rid of certain board members to say, look, we're kind of a different entity and, and, and they got away with that. Maybe with Sergio Ratcliffe owning 25% and not 100%, you could, there could be a way around it. Uh, it's only a minority state right now, but as things stand, it's going to look very hard for United to kind of prove that we're different to Nice without Ratcliffe selling Nice or sacrificing one or the other. Um, but my expectation is there's got to be a loophole. Would the Glazers have set Ratcliffe if they knew they were going to miss out on 50 million UCL qualification because of Nice? I don't know. I think there's got to be a loophole. The RB clubs found a loophole. Qatar, because everyone, remember when we were linked to Qatar, everyone kept talking about this. When we were linked to Qatar, everyone kept talking about all oh, their own PSG, their own PSG. And Qatar made it clear in like February, March time that they were, it was, PSG was not going to be a problem. They were going to prove that they were this and PSG was that. But none of the journalists said this about Ratcliffe. None of the journalists said, well, he owns Nice. No, no one mentioned that. Qatar got so much stick for owning PSG that they found a way within March time to say, no, it doesn't matter. We're both being the Champions League, blah, blah, blah. And, and Qatar had found their loophole. The RB clubs have found their loophole. So my expectation on this is, is surely Sergio Ratcliffe will find a loophole with that. And hopefully he does. Now, I want to quickly get into the transfer stories and then I'll get into a few other news going about. Um, but I want to quickly dive into this about midfielders. And this was a player that Romano said were interested in signing in summer. A lot of players have linked us to, and that is Fafana of Monaco. It was said that Manchester United are considering a 35 million euro January bid for Monaco midfielder Fafana. Juventus are also interested. United's leading scout has fed nothing back but positives about Fafana, believing he could have an instant impact on the midfield. And Ratcliffe wants him as a first signing. Now, CM.com aren't the most reliable source, but we know United have been scouting this guy because Fabrizio Romano has confirmed that. We know that he's a very similar profile to Anana, who we're going to get into. United have also been scouting. And we know that Man United want that sort of physical 6 8 
hybrid midfield profile, it's very obvious that that is probably the midfield signing that United want to do. I'd say keep an eye on Fofana. I think a January move is unlikely, but I think with the Paul Mitchell links, I think with the French League links, and I think with the fact that that is the profile of midfield that United want, keep an eye. The other midfielder Man United have been looking at and heavily linked to is Anana of Everton. And it was said because of Everton's sort of ban coming up or points deduction, financial situation, that Anana um, potentially could be sold in January for, and clubs like United might go for him. 21 years of age, again, 6'8", high player, good off the ball, good physicality. It's very obvious that's the kind of signing United want to make. I think I prefer Anana to Fafana just because I know more about Anana and he's younger and he's Premier League proven. But I do think one of those midfielders to United but could become very likely. Now there is report of midfielders leaving, there's reports of Casemiro leaving but I don't think that's going to happen I think Man United want to keep Casemiro for at least another year and hope he finds his form it was said breaking, Casemiro is thinking about a move to Saudi Arabia, however Manchester United don't want him to leave at all, they hope they're able to convince him to stay one or two more years in England to try and fight to regain titles and great first therefore the clubs are working on remodelling the sports project with departures and arrivals and staff and Casemiro doesn't rule out staying. So Varian has been linked to leaving Casemiro has been linked to leaving but a lot of good sources saying actually look Casemiro is open to stay United don't have plans for Casemiro to leave yet they don't want him to leave and Fabrizio Romano also said um, that there will be movement for Man United midfielder in January and at European interest and he was talking about Donny van der Beek Fabrizio Romano has said exclusively to court offside that there's no concrete update yet on Donny van der Beek but he's one of the players very much expected to leave in January United and van der Beek will find a solution for sure though there is no clarity yet about specific club it's too early but Fabrizio Romano has pretty much confirmed that he'd be very surprised if Donny van der Beek doesn't leave United in January there's not a club yet but he's saying there's an interest in Europe he should leave in January I think Donny's going to accept anyone that wants it now then um, now, Eric Tenog made a few comments. Some people aren't happy with the comments Eric Tenog said, but he did a little bit of an interview about the tough start to the season, and I want to link it to what I was saying in my live stream last night. Tenog said, we're a third of the way through the season. It's been a tough start, but I think we're catching up. In the last five games, we've won four. We're on the right track. Before we start this busy schedule, I think we are building and acquiring confidence and developing automatisms. He always says that word. I don't really know what he means. Uh, we hope now that we can stay more or less within the same group because I think that's what's been a problem for us so far every time we've had to make changes. He's basically saying, oh, hopefully hopefully we can actually start sticking with the same lineup a bit more because when you're constantly making changes, you constantly have to learn something new, which I get. I wanted to change the lineup because I don't like it, but if it's starting to get results, I guess you've got to stick with it and, and hope that there's no more injuries as well. Continuing on, Eric Tenog said there's no easy game in the Premier League and everyone's going to lose points at one point or another. So you have to make sure you're consistent because they're going to lose points too. He said, now we can hope, uh, now we hope we can more or less stay with the same lineup or 12 or 14 players while constructing the lineup because I think so far that was our difficulty. Every time we have to change, we don't develop our routines every time we have to change, which I think is a good point. He's had this routine he wanted to develop in pre season, then literally every single player got injured, and then you're putting players in, you're putting players out. Certain players aren't used to playing with these players, and he's, he can't really get that routine that he wants because if you've got a sort of solid starting 11, 12, 13, and then you just have to make one change here and there. It is easy. And I think he makes a point. A lot of people are saying excuses, excuses, but I think he makes a point. And I spoke about how Martinez and, and Shaw's return is going to be massive for Ten Hag in my live stream last night. And Ethan's done a tweet basically explaining what I was trying to explain, but a lot better. So I'm going to read out Ethan's tweet, which kind of links to what Ten Hag's saying about players being missing, which kind of links to what I said in my live stream last night. And he said this, in pre-season, Eric Ten Hag um, often had the Sandro Martinez move into the pivot next to Casemiro when United had control of the ball. Varane was the central centre-back and Shaw and Mamba Saka were the wide centre-backs. It was insight into how he wanted the team to function. Martinez moving into the pivot, subsided for Fernandes and Mount being high eights. It gave Varane a role where he was mostly facing play, not having to be primary ball handler to his benefit and asked more of the wide centre-backs and Martinez in possession. He said Martinus and Shaw's injuries were catastrophic, forced a reactive abandonment of this idea because the players behind Martinus and Shaw simply can't replicate the in-possession role of those two, 100%. By the day, two players that can be reliable contenders to their places are comfortable being tasked with progression and ball handling in deep areas whilst offering adequate off-the-ball physical characteristics becoming increasing importance. Uh, we will never maximise personnel on our team nor, nor this way of playing if we pin our playing way to two players and abandon it if they are unavailable, which is what we're doing. Not um, sustainable and a dangerous precedent for the squad building. So this is why we've got to bring in someone for those positions like Inacio, Braithwaite, etc., who we've kind of been linked to. And I think he hits the nail on the head with sort of the problems this season. 
it was that was exactly what I was trying to say in my live stream last night. Luke Shaw and Martinus return could be massive for Ten Hag. Martinus isn't back for another month, but Luke Shaw is coming back now. I think the difference that they will make, and it might it might not make a massive difference right away because we've got to get used to that way of playing. But Ten Hag had the way of playing. He has a way he wants to play. Um, and we just don't have the players to do that when Martinez and Luke Shaw are injured, which means we have to improve in those positions. We have to bring a better depth, but also it shows a lot of problems. And I've always been quite positive that when Martinez and Shaw are back, we'll get a lot better than people think. Uh, we've got a little bit more update on Ratcliffe because, you know, Ratcliffe hasn't been announced. And we're saying, well, the longer it takes for Ratcliffe to be announced, will he be able to be here in January? Because there's a six to eight week Premier League ownership test. Well, the United Muppeteers have been quite accurate with the Ratcliffe report and said this. They said once Sergio Ratcliffe's 25% uh, state deal was announced. There will be statements made about a potential pathway to majority ownership. Um, the assessment period after Sergio Ratcliffe's investment is announced is ex is not expected to be as long as six to eight weeks, as some details have already been completed. They're saying once it's done, it, it could just be a matter of weeks, uh, not like six to eight weeks. And they're saying that they are having talks about his pathway to majority ownership, which is most important thing, is that eventually he becomes full owner. We need the Glazers out. We need a full sale. We need to know what the pathway is for Ratcliffe being full owner because we need we don't want the Glazers here at Man United any longer. And then the last bit of story I want to get into is that Rasmus Hoyland is a doubt for the Everton game. We've heard that Luke Shaw's back, Anana's back, Rashford's fit for the Everton game, wan should be good, but Hoyland is a doubt for the Everton game. If Hoyland is not fit, I don't want to play him because I don't want to risk making his current injury worse. But I think Hoyland's such an important player. What he does off the ball, what he does on the ball is so good. But I have to say, Martial is fit and Martial is never fit. Martial is one of the only players that hasn't got injured this season. And Martial has a good record against Everton. So for me, if Hoyland isn't ready, don't rush him back. Because that's what we did with Martinez. He got a worse injury. Save Hoyland for the Champions League game. Play Martial against Everton. That is what I do. And Martial has a good record against Everton. I don't think Martial's got the legs with his injury record and stuff, but there's a good player in Martial. He's an intelligent player. He can do what Tenog's system requires. I think we do look better when Mar Martial plays sometimes. Hoyland's obviously better than Martial, but I wouldn't rush Hoyland back if he's not 100%. I'd save him for Galatasaray. I'd put, I'd put um, Martial in if need be. Anyway, people, please do hit that like button. Of course, subscribe down below if you're new. Thank you for watching. Hopefully the quality didn't drop out too much. I've got internet issues today. Thank you for watching. Bye.